Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town, and we've got a legislative update with our state representative, Dave Rogers. Dave, thanks for coming, as always. Great to be here. We always appreciate conversations with you. Thank so you. when we were talking last time, um, we spent a lot of time talking about the budget, and I will, uh, I will remember, uh, it's easy to remember, the fact that you were very optimistic, that you were speaking about something that usually <laughs> is you know a frustrating th it can be a frustrating thing etc and you were calling it this is a good budget yeah lots you know just m meaning more money for important programs etc right so it wasn't everything was n things are a little bit further along at this point than yeah. they were when we last spoke so let's start by just getting an update from you on on progress um, of the budgetary process, but also of the things that really matter to you that are that were good news there. Sure, great. Well, um, I guess the key thing, uh, one of the biggest things in the budget that was passed um, was the biggest year-over-year -year increase in education aid from the state um, in terms of a percentage increase, I think in two decades. So big money for education which benefited the communities I represent, but also the state as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's great news. Um, I mean, education's the, the key to the mm -hmm. future. Uh, every student deserves a shot at the American dream, an equal opportunity, so, um, and it's an investment in our future. Uh, and I think it's something that has driven my public service and um, something I've always advocated for. So certainly pleased to see that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we just passed the Student Opportunity Act which will, so the budget this year was a down payment on that, mm -hmm. so a big increase, but then we just passed the Student Opportunity Act, which is a once in a generation transformational investment in education, because there was the Foundation Budget Review Commission, they did an, a deep dive, I had co-sponsored legislation to help create the Foundation Budget Review Commission, they did a deep dive on the data, on all the uh, funding streams for different, f based on f different factors, and determined that there were four factors that were causing uh, the state to lag on fully funding mm -hmm. uh, education. I mean, most education funding is at, at the local level. Right. So in the towns I represent, Cambridge, Arlington, Belmont, comes from city government, town government. But state aid is important. And uh, what the study I found is that four factors, uh, educating those with English as a second language, uh, those with special education needs, uh, the cost of health care, providing health care, and then finally disparities in different zip codes mm -hmm. around the state from lower income areas to higher income areas. Those four main factors had caused the state to lag um, with funding or not fully fund um, education and we um, passed a bill that will spend billions more over the coming years I, I th on education. I, the figure I'd heard is like 1.5 billion or something like that over seven, the next seven years Yeah, perhaps? but then, then that once that's in the budget, mm -hmm. that becomes uh, the new baseline. Uh -huh. And that's the thing about budgeting. So the, the conversation is always, will it get a 2% increase or 3% increase or 1% increase or be level funded, hopefully never cut. Mm -hmm. So once you establish that as the new baseline. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right, then it just yeah, builds if you from think, there. Oh generally. yeah, I mean, this mm -hmm. is, billions more for education mm -hmm. and um, so it, it's just a, a great development so so the state budget which the house took up back in April uh, was a down payment on funding and then going forward um, we'll see more funds for education across the board and the, by the way the Student Opportunity Act well went well beyond the four factors I, just I was mentioned. going to just ask that whether yeah whether for the mass school the building case. authority mm -hmm. for fully funding charter school reimbursements to districts and, and in lots of other ways. So um, so basically the Student Opportunity Act is tackling all four of those areas, but also in addition to that, a number of other. Going beyond. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times when a piece of legislation or a new law is crafted, developed, and passed on Beacon Hill, there are supporters. There's always a critic who said, well, you could have done this a little differently or that a little differently. The, Just one, huh? Well, or, or <laughs> more than one. <laughs> right, right. But it was a universal chorus of acclaim when the student opportunity pa I mean, passed all across the board from whether it's the teachers unions, whether it's outside mm -hmm. advocacy groups, whether uh, all across the board education advocates said, wow, home run. 
And so anytime you can be part of a process that delivers a home run on something as important as education, um, it, it, it's a tremendous moment. Yeah, and, you feel, and, yeah. Well, and it's why good. I got into this line of work, mm -hmm. is to try to make a positive difference in the world, in the community, my, our small corner of the world, and then the Commonwealth as a whole. And on a broader scale, I mean, we've seen Massachusetts be a leader on health care. Obamacare was um, based on a law passed here. And in lots of other areas where Massachusetts becomes a leader where the other 49 states or federal policymakers can look at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I always say lately that I'm mindful of the moment where we have um, impeachment proceedings going on at the federal level, where we have... Um, gridlock and dysfunction. Um, I saw Susan Rice, who was Obama's national yep. security advisor, interviewed recently. You know, other, you know, along with Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, national security advisor is, you know, serving at the most, the highest echelon uh, of government. And Susan Rice said something pretty profound and, and interesting. And I, I follow policy and politics. I live it daily. Yep. And but she said our divisions at the national level, our inability to broker deals, even on things that should be on balance relatively less controversial. And such traditionally as have been, right? Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not a Republican bridge. It's not a Democratic bridge. It's not a Libertarian bridge. It's a bridge, mm -hmm. and it needs to be fixed. But our federal government can't even reach um, agreement on basic things that are the government function. And to get to, to get to my point, what Susan Rice said, the National Security Advisor said, is our inability to govern ourselves at the federal level has become our number one national security threat. Because if we're weak at home, it makes it more difficult to project uh, American values and leadership mm -hmm. around the world. If, if you're, if you're um, withering away from within, right. How can you project influence and project American values around the world of democracy, liberty, and freedom? So I, I realize I'm getting a little bit far afield, no, but, but, I but mean, my it's point is how that do, when, how, how yeah, does that impact well, what you're doing here? Well, when we here are doing meaningful, important things where there are difficult, nettlesome public policy challenges, mm -hmm. but we're able to, through a legislative process, listen to all stakeholders, all points of view, and craft a meaningful, once-in-a-generation, transformational investment in education. Mm -hmm. What I say is it is critically important that we do so now more than ever because of the dysfunction at the federal level. The states must go into the vacuum, the void, and lead. And, and then hopefully um, these ideas that are... are uh, Kind that of we're fostering that we're lab, here. Right, right, percolating in the labs. The of laboratories the of democracy, right. as Brandeis called the states, mm -hmm. um, become a beacon uh, for a future time when we will see the ship turn at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So, again, that's my phrase I've been finding myself using a lot lately. Mm -hmm. I am mindful of this moment. Mm -hmm. And it, it energizes me, uh, it, it gives me um, a great purpose to the work I do, and um, so and that's why I've, it's been a remarkable time to serve in our state legislature, because we're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. I always wish we would do more. Right. I always want to be forward-leaning. I never rest on your laurels, but if you look at the last four or five years, whether it's sweeping criminal justice reform, women's pay equity, a bill I introduced, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which is the creation of a major new civil right for women. Uh, in the workplace, uh, the New York Times had done a big study that one of the biggest barriers women face is right. pregnancy discrimination. So it's nothing less than the creation of a major new right. Um, so, and, and that's the tip of the iceberg. The four or five bills I just mentioned, there, there's 30 mm -hmm. others I can mention. So again, I wish always to do more, always be forward leaning. Um, but you and but, I have discussed but, in the past that, you know, as as you've often pointed out that public policy making is complicated. It is. And difficult, maybe much harder than people, you know, ha out, out here uh, in the public have a recognition of. And so when you can, like you said, string together a number of major 
pieces of legislation that are going to be, you know, having effects and beneficial effects, we assume, uh, for the population for years to come, I, I assume you do need to pause and enjoy that moment um, because yeah. there's a lot of work that you're doing that doesn't find fruition in that way, I think, right? Right, and, and I, think, I think that's a, a good way to, uh, to, f to frame it. And um, another one is 3,200 megawatts of offshore wind. Mm -hmm. uh, 800 megawatts is the Vineyard Wind Project. It's being temporarily held up by the Bureau of Ocean Management at the federal level. Uh, we're hopeful to see that clear. I think they're looking at uh, the fisheries, the effect of these big offshore wind projects on a variety of uh, fronts, how they'll impact fisheries and, and mm -hmm. uh, um, maybe migratory bird patterns and other, other factors. But 800 megawatts is, because I, I sort of said to folks that I work with, if I'm talking to people in the community, I can't just say 800 megawatts, right. unless they're an electrical right. engineer, exactly. or they, it's th their business or something they know a good deal about. Right. So I did some digging, some research, and uh, 800 megawatts is enough to power 400,000 homes. 3,200 megawatts, which is what's been authorized by the legislature, is up to uh, 1.6 million homes. It's a huge, it would- So do you mean 400,000 homes for a year? For 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 how like for how long? Well, assuming the wind keeps blowing, right? In perpetuity, just, just into perpetuity. Awesome. So indefinitely, it's enough to power four hundred thousand homes. That's that's where they get their power from. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but that's the first of eight hundred megawatts of thirty two hundred megawatts. Now another eight hundred megawatts just went out for bid. So. Um, Gas leaks, a major build to repair gas leaks, in in increasing the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which is the big investor-owned utilities, the amount of energy they must procure yep. from clean energy sources. So, again, I, I've said this before in our conversation. I'll say it again. It's not a reason to rest on your laurels. It's it's not a reason to say, well, we've got that right. done. You know, yeah, put your feet I mean, up. No, we, I, I, if you look at the suite or the portfolio of legislation I've introduced, you'll quickly discern that I'm not right. Uh, you're, I'm you're, not you're pausing. Ambitions, right. No, no, you, because I mean, uh, if you're going to do this work, the um, the only reason, in my opinion, to do this work uh, is if you are driven, uh, truly driven, to make a significant difference for the people that you represent and those throughout the Commonwealth. So that's my mission. Um, I take it seriously. Um, you know, I try to bring joy to public service as serious as what we do is. Mm -hmm. I try to do it, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, with joy in my heart, with energy. But, um, and I try to, um, but for all that said of doing it with joy in my heart, I'm, I'm Got it. quite a sense of seriousness of purpose about this right. work. Got to get things done. Right. Really. And, 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 and when we work. do get things done, it's, it's rewarding. Yeah. So congratulations on that, but we're going to move right sure. on to, uh, to more stuff that's still on, on the table, and we're wondering uh, where, the, you know, where the winds are blowing here. Um, so uh, I don't want to get the, the official name of the committee that you are chair of wrong. So <laughs> would you just tell me? I'm the chair mm -hmm. of the Cannabis Policy Committee. Cannabis Policy Committee. It's the first time I've been I chair of a committee. Right. Um, and... You know, it takes time to kind of work your way up to that. Um, well, I'm glad I asked because I would have forgotten the policy yeah. part. I um, think it was called marijuana, right Canada, and the, there was a sense that uh, some believe the sort of the etymology or the origin of the word marijuana is a, has a pejorative connotation. Mm -hmm. um, so the thought was to change it cannabis, to cannabis. Cannabis, nice and scientific. So yeah, it was sure marijuana nice policy last term. It's now cannabis policy. Fair enough. One way or the other, that puts you right in the heart of the of of one of the, you know, topics of great interest currently uh, out here in the public, and that is vaping and the dangers thereof, the actions of the government in response to what we know or don't know uh, about that. So specifically, um, there is a ban on certain vaping products that I believe is now been passed by the legislature. Yeah, what, what um, as happened? Well as um, increased taxation in right. that area. So what happened is, as you know, there's been a spate, uh, sadly, mm -hmm. of deaths around the United States, including uh, some here. 
I believe, three, two or three. Um, obviously, that's incredibly serious, and it's a public health threat that um, the governor responded to with a ban. Now, there is no more dramatic step a governor can make than a ban. And so people looked at that and wondered, is that trying to solve the problem with a sledgehammer when you could be solving it with a scalpel? In other words, was a ban truly called for? Mm -hmm. It put a lot of these vaping stores, including one in Davis Square, I happen to walk by, they're shuttered, they're closed. Now, if that's required, it's required. Public health and safety is paramount. Um, but many said that what are really causing the harm are the illegal vapes. There is an underground market oh, for vapes that uh, people buy. People buy them online. And now with so much e-commerce or internet commerce, a lot of these vapes are being bought online. Some are just made by local unlicensed manufacturers. And so people said, well, while the gover governor may be well-intentioned, did he go too far with a total ban? Mm -hmm. And so litigation commenced. And even the governor, when he put the ban in place, said people can avail themselves of the courts. And so people did. Uh, the litigation has proceeded. And what happened is uh, a court ruled that uh, with regards to most products, the ban can stay in place, but that with regard to cannabis, that really only the CCC, the regulatory authority, could, could um, completely ban it because you have medical cannabis users. That's one it, of the ones, one it, of the things I wanted to ask you about. It's their medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's how many medical cannabis users get their medicine. Mm -hmm. So what happened then is um, as to the judge's ruling, it, expi uh, it said that the, the ban on medical vaping of flour um, mm -hmm. as opposed to liquid, tea, uh, liquid uh, cannabis um, would, it, would expire on November 12th, earlier this week. And the CCC then came out with their own, but it's deferring to the CCC, so the, the right, superior court, the judge, ruled the CCC could intervene. Right. The CCC then put out a statement um, saying that it would, the ban would continue, except for medical flower patients. So cannabis patients, medical patients, not adult use, can use it now. And then the CCC also announced this week they're going to take up the issue of regulation mm -hmm. and um, of how to regulate these vapes. Uh, meanwhile, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control at the federal level, believes they have identified the culprit. It's called vitamin E acetate. And the CDC believes, uh, I guess through autopsies or other examination of medical records, have determined that uh, those who... Um, died from this showed evidence of vitamin E acetate in their lungs. Um, yeah, this is very recent. Yeah, this is all f very recent. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I said, yeah, the judge's ruling was just effective this days. week. The mm -hmm. CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission, our state regulatory authority, came out this week. I mean, here we're sitting, we, for folks who don't know at home, we're, that, we're right. sitting here on, uh, on, mid mid -November, on yeah. Thursday the 14th. 14th. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this was November, <laughs> just two days ago. Mm -hmm. And, so and things are just kind of unfolding yes, in this area, right, as we, right. literally as we but speak. But it's mostly obviously. been regulatory mm -hmm. as opposed to legislative, meaning it's been the governor. That's right. Uh, and, and then the state and the judge and the courts. So it's both the judiciary and the executive branch, the governor and our courts, as opposed to in our right. sphere. But yeah. there now is some right. legislative action on the table, right? Right. Well, there could be. Or could be, okay. Yeah. Uh, depending on uh, the outcome of what the CCC does, what the courts do, and what the governor does, we can react mm -hmm. to that. And if we think the law has been crafted in a way that doesn't make sense to protect public health and safety, while at the same time not being a case of overreach where you've not only protected public health and safety so much that you've, you've gone beyond what you need to do and thereby forced a lot of patients to be in a tough spot so it, it's a, for lack of a better way to put it, a fluid situation that we need to watch. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll be prepared to act if we need to. Um, so, But right now it's really kind of in other bodies' courts. 
the court at the moment. In other words, the CCC has to continue to ev ev evolve their own policy around this. Yeah. Um, That's and correct. We have to get more information from right. the CDC, as you mentioned, yeah. et cetera. So things are, as you said, fluid, and we can check back in with you yeah. um, during our next conversation. And I imagine there will be progress to report on at that point. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have deaths or injuries, um, we're getting into incredible, the most serious thing the government does. Well, that. And I, don't, I have to be fair, the governor took a lot of heat. And as chair of the committee, I had a lot of folks from the industry come to me, including adult use, and say, this is terrible, this is wrong. And I said, well, look, people have died. I'm not a doctor, right? People I don't, have died mysteriously. Right. I don't have a master's in public health. The governor, I presume, has highly qualified public health experts advising him. He thought it prudent, given that there have been deaths, to put a ban in place. Now, the courts have said the ban went too far uh, for medical vaping of cannabis if you're an actual patient. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. In other words, I guess I wasn't as prone to become hyperbolic about this. And this is so terrible what the governor's done. He was trying to protect lives. Right. And, and, um, and the, the people have availed themselves of our court system courts have weighed in now and um, so yeah and again you as you mentioned um, there's a you know it there's just a difference a fundamental difference once people start dying of something that again is not explained or understood at that time and uh, and that seems like one of the fundamental responsibilities of government to respond to such situations. Absolutely. Whether it bans the right way or the wrong way, and whether there's something else that could be more scalpel-like than sledgehammer-like, et cetera, all that is to be debated and worked out. But nonetheless, government response is something we would all want in that situation. Absolutely. Which leads me to uh, ask you, I, 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 a lot of times we're talking about specific programs, legislation, bills pending, um, things coming up, et cetera, and we ask you about those. I want to step back for a second with sure. the remainder of our conversation and just ask your opinion, your thoughts as, a, as somebody who operates in this environment about a central question that's raised by the vaping situation here, and that is um, the, the, the dynamic between uh, what we all would see as personal responsibility. We're all responsible for our own conduct. There's lots of people, as we know, lots of Americans out there who think government stay out of my business you know I I will I am an adult and I will be responsible for my behavior etc so you have a question you know when when it comes to vaping etc for many many people this is a voluntary thing this is not medication etc this is something that they're choosing to do right um, then it turns out to be dangerous the government feels the a, again a responsibility to intervene so what I would ask is, as between personal responsibility um, of individual citizens and government's um, uh, obligation to, for, to uh, safeguard public safety uh, or to, right. you know, to promote public safety, how do you see you know, government's role in that situation and your role as a legislator um, in dealing with these kinds of difficult problems which again s could be interpreted as hey that person's making that decision they're gonna have to live with it or yeah. not sure um, well folks decide they want to as a uh, maybe uh, for uh, recreation or adventure they go skydiving but I'd like to believe we would all think there should be at least some sensible regulation of skydiving companies uh, folks choose to get on a plane to travel all the time for business or pleasure. But I think all of us want to have a strong Federal Aviation Administration with engineers and aeronautical engineers and air traffic controllers and the like to make sure the planes we get on are safe. In other words, uh, we do live in a society that's free. Uh, I definitely believe deeply in liberty and that people should have sort of maximum freedom to pursue their dreams and live their lives. On the other hand, we have to have a sensible regulatory framework in different spheres of our lives and in, in 
regulating businesses, regulating all sorts of things, um, to protect public health and safety. And, and it's a great question because there's always an inherent tension in those two competing things, liberty, freedom, and yet protecting public health and safety. Um, and where do, you, where do you personally fall there um, as, a, as a legislator? Do you think, do you take, do you think each, uh, each uh, time this kind of thing would arise, you just would have to look at the specific circumstances and make your determination that way? Yes. Or, okay. Didn't mean to cut off the rest of the yeah, question. Yeah, no, that's fine. But I, I mean, but I think you framed it so well that I would just quickly interject, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, each situation is fact dependent, fact specific. Often scientists, engineers, and experts have to weigh in. And um, it's like I think we talked about before we came on air um, uh, that uh, sometimes folks want a simple, pithy bumper sticker slogan. Uh, but in fact, most public policy questions are complicated. And you do need to have experts. You need to hear from all the various stakeholders. Uh, the law is about drawing lines. And the question is, where do you draw the line? Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, lawmaking is, is imperfect, but you try to get as close to the appropriate place to draw lines in the law as you can. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean when you say that you would treat things on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of your determining what you think is right to do, does that mean that there you could imagine that there would be situations in which you would say, um, you know, no, that really is a kind of more question of personal responsibility and people need to take responsibility for their behavior and there's not a role for government and, reg and government's regulatory authority there. Well, I mean, personal responsibility is important. Um, as you say, we all have a responsibility to govern our own conduct. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we know human behavior is such that in certain spheres you need to have uh, rules, guidelines, regulations. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the balance that's always being struck mm -hmm. in the lawmaking process and the regulatory process. I'm, I'm really not trying to push you into a corner, I promise, but I'm just curious whether in some way you're saying that that you, part of what motivates you as a, as a legislator, as part of the governmental apparatus, is in some ways to protect people from themselves or from their worst instincts or decisions or things like that. Is, is that part of what government does as far as you're Perhaps, concerned? Perhaps, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking out loud, sure. as I tend to do from time to time. I mean, almost if you looked at a, a bell curve, of human behavior, and there's sort of the median or, or the, the middle uh, where most people's conduct, but then there are either side. Um, and um, think of investing. Are you a high-risk investor that wants to put your money in speculative small capitalization stocks, or do you want to put all your money in a money market uh, account that will never go down in value but won't go up as much either? And the government does have a role in financial regulation to make sure the stock market and the financial products that you or I might look at. Uh, not that I have a ton of money to put into them, but what money I might have or you might have, mm -hmm. um, that uh, you are, in a sense, protecting investors from um, not only themselves, but unscrupulous Fair financial enough. practices. Um, so keep in with the world of, of vaping. Are there unscrupulous manufacturers or online, or even if they're not unscrupulous, which would imply bad intent, just negligent. They don't have the necessary capacity to create the vape pen or whatever these devices are in a way that's safe for the public. So um, maybe it's not only just protecting folks from themselves, as you phrased it, but more uh, protecting uh, the public from shoddy manufacturing pro practices um, and the like. Mm -hmm. Unsafe conditions. Mm -hmm. Well. I appreciate your being willing to think out, think aloud um, <laughs> and on the air about something that I'm sure you don't often, you know, have to have to probe. No, and I appreciate of sort of the thought-provoking <laughs> questions. Uh, it's it makes my job more interesting, and I, I enjoy these kind of conversations. Um, uh, but they're you know they're 
they're often not one, is not one easy answer. Right. Fair enough, and yeah. we will never hold you, I promise, <laughs> to easy answers. Uh, we will only hold you to coming back and continuing <laughs> these conversations. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. I always appreciate it, and uh, I love being of service to the community. Yeah, it's always energizing to talk to you in addition to illuminating, so um, we, we genuinely appreciate it. Thank you. So on behalf of our state representative, Dave Rogers, this is Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and we appreciate you being here.